everyone. This is Kathy Lean with BK Forex. Fabulous. Um, so today I am I'm delighted to be here um, because I'm delighted to you know have an opportunity to talk to you about um, how to trade commodity currencies. As one of our attendees just pointed out, we've got um, Dollar CAD moving quite rapidly right now, and we'll talk about that and what's causing this uh, movement higher in dollar cat. I'm also really excited because today is the very first day of us um, relaunching our BK Forex products. We have also introduced something called BK Trading Club. So at the end of this presentation, I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking about it um, uh, so that we can kind of kick off our product um, with you know a little bit of excitement from the FX Street attendees. So before we can begin though, I'm obliged to read to you this disclaimer, so if you'll bear with me, I'm going to try to do it quickly. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Trading Forex carries a high level of risk and may not be suitable for all investors. The high degree of leverage can work against you as well as for you. Before deciding to trade any such leveraged product, you carefully consider your investment objectives, level of experience, and risk appetite. The possibility exists that you can sustain a loss of some or all of your initial investments, and therefore you should not invest money that you cannot afford to lose. You should be aware of all the risks associated with trading on margin, and seek advice from an independent financial advisor if you have any doubts. The information, including commentary and trade ideas provided in bkforex.com, should not be related, re relied on upon as a substitute for extensive independent research, which should be performed before making your investment decisions. BK Forex LLC and bkforex.com are merely providing this information for your general information. The information and opinions presented do not take into account any particular individual's investment objectives, financial, financial situation, or needs. All investors should obtain advice based on a unique situation before making any investment decision and should tailor the trade side and leverage of their trading to their personal risk appetite. BK Forex LLC will not be responsible for any losses incurred um, on investments made by readers and clients as a result of any information contained in this presentation. Um, BK Forex LLC do not render investment, legal, accounting, tax, or other professional advice. If investment, legal, tax, or other expert assistance is sought, the services of a competent professional should be sought. So with that, um, I'm going to share with you what we're going to talk about today. Um, every currency pair is unique, and I think that's very important to understand um, the unique characteristics of what drives the various currency pairs. Because right now, for example, you know, one of the attendees pointed out um, that um, dollar cat is um, enjoying quite a bit of a move, but you know, dollar yen, pound dollar, and um, you know, many of the other currencies aren't moving at all. So why is dollar CAD moving? We'll talk about that because it is a unique um, characteristic and drivers of CAD that is moving the um, currency pair. In terms of, in terms of um, what we're going to cover for each currency pair, we're going to discuss a little bit about the background, talk about um, you know, the central bank and um, the, back, the economic backdrop of the country. Then we're going to um, go over some trading tips, charts, and then the outlook for each currency. Uh, I'm going to cover the Australian dollar, the New Zealand dollar, the Canadian dollar, and if we have some time, we may even talk about the Swiss franc. If not, um, you know, the Swiss franc usually doesn't move too much by itself anyway, so uh, it won't be too much of a loss not to cover it. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and start with the, US, the Australian dollar. Okay, in terms of the Australian dollar, first I want to say that um, of the three commodity producing countries and their currencies, the Australian dollar tends to move the most. And um, you know, while you know the Canadian dollar is a more actively traded currency or transacted currency than the Australian dollar, the Australian dollar um, sees a lot more action. And it sees a lot more action because interest rates uh, tend to be higher, so there um, is generally more of a there's generally more of a um, risk on, risk off factor in the Aussie dollar itself. And um, it also tends to move more because it is considered um, what we call a high beta currency, and this is partly due to the higher interest rates. Um, high beta currency, for those of you that do not know, is you know just a fancy word for a currency that tends to be um, a little a little more volatile than the other currencies, or a little bit, or has a slightly stronger correlation with um, a slightly stronger correlation with the general risk environment. So. 
the Australian dollar is quite exciting to trade, in my opinion. Um, for some people, that is a good thing. For some people, it's not such a good thing because uh, more excitement typically means more volatility. The Aussie dollar tends to be a little bit more of a trending currency pair, and we'll get into more of that as we go into the Aussie dollar. But first, let me talk a little bit about the background of the Aussie. For those of you that may not be so familiar with trading the commodity currencies, we'll start off on the Aussie is uh, you know, is is uh, the Australian dollar's nickname the Aussie, and uh, the symbol is the A dollar sign. It is actually the fifth most actively transacted currency in the world, and um, it accounts for about 7.6 percent of all daily turnover. In terms of the um, Australian dollar, it is it is. Um, also the fourth most actively traded currency in the world. So it is something that um, is, is receiving quite a bit of attention from FX traders, particularly since um, the Australian dollar is frequently um, used as a way to express people's um, sentiment with regards to China. Um, typically, you know, because Australia counts China as one of its most important trade partners. A lot of times when we get Chinese economic data like this week, um, we tend to have some outsized moves, or we can have some outsized moves in the Australian dollar. Um, of all the G20 nations, um, Australia has one of the um, highest interest rates, and I think that you know this is um, something that is also one of the reasons why the Australian dollar um, has you know been so volatile because the Reserve Bank of Australia has recently cut interest rates, so people are believing that the the gap between Australian interest rates and other currencies may start to narrow. Now, Australia is an export-dependent economy um, that is heavily reliant on the mining industry. So this is um, important because when you have an export-dependent economy, and this is true of all three commodity currencies, um, a strong exchange rate is not a good thing um, because when you have a strong exchange rate, it kind of um, hurts or it can take a big toll on um, demand from other countries. Now, for Australia in particular, they do have, you know, a, a kind of core base of domestic activity. So while they are um, sensitive to um, the strength of the currency, you know, for example, when we were in between June and September, when the Aussie dollar rose from 96 cents up to 106, the RBA did mention that you know, strength of currency was an issue, but they didn't necessarily um, express much concern because they do have um, you know pretty robust domestic demand, and then on top of that, the mining sector was doing very very well, and um, you know China was a little less um, sensitive to the value of the Aussie as you know some other countries may be. So, but regardless, you will see, you know, every so often that in the monetary policy statements of the RBA, they'll mention the currency because they're an export-dependent economy. Now, in terms of the central bank, um, in Australia, the central bank is the Reserve Bank of Australia. And like many central banks around the world, the RBA's mandate is to keep low and stable inflation. Now, in in terms of um, inflation in Australia, let me see if I can pull up um, any recent inflation reports. Um, okay, so I'm looking at my Bloomberg right now. Inflation in the second quarter, inflation is only released on a quarterly basis in Australia, was 1.2%. So considering that their range of inflation that um, they want to keep things between is 1% to 3%, you can see that inflation is um, closer to the lower part of its band. And because it's closer to the lower parts of it, its band, it's not an issue. So inflation is not an issue for the RBA. Um, but if it does rise above 3%, you know, then obviously then it becomes an issue. Um, so in terms of the RBA, because inflation is so, so low, it has provided them with the flexibility to ease monetary policy. The RBA um, meets 11 times a year. So 
in terms of um, their monetary policy actions, they've got two more monetary policy decisions this year. What they typically do not hold a monetary policy announcement in January. They, um, their first monetary policy announcement is in February. So we have two more monetary policy announcements from the RBA this year. Um, in terms of where the RBA stands, um, as I mentioned, the RBA cut interest rates by 25 basis points um, uh, earlier this month. This is not the first rate cut by the RBA this year. They cut rates by 25 basis points in May. They also cut rates by 25 basis points in June. And when I started off, I talked about how the Aussie dollar rallied from a low of 96 cents all the way up to 106, you know, pretty much after the RBA um, cut interest rates because the rate cuts um, tend to be very, very positive for the Australian economy. And believe it or not, we are beginning to see um, the rate cuts translate um, into positive um, economic reports from Australia because the latest business and consumer confidence surveys um, showed that in businesses and investors um, grew more optimistic following the RBA's latest rate cut. So this is a good thing. But um, the question now is whether the RBA is going to raise, so going to cut interest rates again. Now, the market is discounting um, a higher percent chance of a quarter point rate cut in November. As Mike points out, their last rate cut was unexpected, but they did so anyway. And this tonight's um, RBA minutes will be critical and telling us, number one, what drove the RBA over the edge? What triggered their decision to actually cut interest rates when it wasn't something that was widely expected? Aside from that, we'll also be looking for um, you know, any hints of whether or not the RBA is ready to ease again in November. If we get a neutral RBA statement, um, it will uh, help the Aussie dollar recover and it even maybe break it above last week's high of 102.95, so pretty much 103. But unfortunately, if the RBA minutes show that the central bank not only eased um, last um, time they met, but they want to ease again because they're so worried about the economy, that that could drive the Aussie dollar below 102, which would open the door for a move down to parity. So this upcoming RBA's um, minutes is very, very important. In all likelihood, you know, I think that um, the RBA cuts interest rates by 25 basis points. I think there's probably a stronger chance that they're going to be neutral and only slightly dovish um, because they may not want to just kind of pre-commit to another easing before seeing how things transpire in the global economy, in Europe, in the stock market, and in China, because China has a huge set of economic data this week that um, – you know, could help shape the RBA's um, monetary policy stance. So if the RBA minutes show a, a neutral to only slightly dovish stance, that we may get a little bit of a relief rally in the Aussie. Economic data has not been all that horrendous either. If you remember last week, we had the employment numbers from Australia, and um, we had about 14,000 jobs created, which is a rebound from negative job growth in August. So from the perspective of the labor market, things are getting a little bit better. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, consumer and business confidence has improved. So there are reasons why the RBA may move a little bit to neutral. And um, if that's the case, or at least you know, buy their time until they see how things transpire this month. And if that's the case, we could get a little relief rally um, in the Australian dollar. So I talked about how um, you know Australia's most important, Australia is relying very heavily or watching this week's Chinese economic data very closely. The reason why they're watching this week's uh, Chinese data closely is because China is their number one trade partner. For a very um, long time, especially during the global financial crisis, China single-handedly held up the whole Asia region. And that's why you see this little cute little image I've got here that says Australia-China prosperity through partnership. Because Australia realizes that they live and die by China. And they live and die more specifically by China's demand for their resources. So what is good for China is good for Australia. What is bad for China is bad for Australia. This week we have a tremendous amount 
of Chinese economic data on the calendar, um, the most important of which is going to be the third quarter GDP numbers. Um, the GDP one, you know, obviously is released on a quarterly basis, and China is expected to report its weakest GDP growth in more than a decade. So the question here is, first of all, will the data be you know, even worse than expectations? If it will be, then um, that would be you know, extremely negative for the Australian dollar, but and this data is not due till Thursday. So once again, tonight's focus is the RBA minutes. On Thursday, um, the focus will be all the Chinese data. So if the GDP growth is weaker um, than 7.4%, then you can certainly expect a risk-off move that will drive the Australian dollar probably below 102. If GDP growth is 7.5% or greater, then um, we could see a nice little relief rally in the markets. But what is more important for the Australian dollar is really what um, the Chinese government could do in response to weaker data. The Chinese data that we had this week is the last set of economic data until the November 8th leadership change. This is the biggest, most important um, leadership change in China in 10 years. Seven out of the nine ruling members will be retiring, so we get seven brand new people um, leading the Chinese government. You know, it's still the same party because it's a one-party country, but um, they may want to show uh, some resolve or show some support by the new leadership by introducing um, some fiscal stimulus after the leadership change. So, you know, we know the Chinese economy is slowing. If the Chinese government comes in with some new monetary or fiscal st stimulus to support their economy and build confidence in the new leadership, that will be very, very positive for the Australian dollar. So that's something that, you know, I will be watching for very carefully because, as I said, Australia lives and dies by China. If China decides to suddenly, you know, inject a huge amount of stimulus, then the need for a rate cut for Australia may not be so high um, or may not be so significant. If China does nothing and they just let data slow and keep their hands crossed, then, you know, the RBA may have to be moved forward with another 25 basis point rate cut. In terms of um, the industry, even though China's export-dependent economy, there's still a very, sorry, Australia's export-dependent economy, there's still also a very services-based um, uh, industry. So what does Australia sell? Well, Australia is the world's number one exporter of coal. And, surprise, surprise, their number one destination of where this coal is going is China. Um, iron ore accounts for 20% of total Chinese exports, and coal accounts for 16% of total exports. So the price of coal and iron ore is very important to Australia, and the demand for coal and iron ore is also very important. In terms of economic data from Australia, these are the pieces of economic data that we expect um, most significantly um, to have the most significant reaction on the Australian dollar. Last week, we had employment numbers scheduled for release already. Retail sales are also very important. PMI numbers for manufacturing and service sector. Uh, th this is kind of the reason why people expect the RBA to cut again. So this, was, this is what uh, one of the attendees is asking. So do we expect a rate cut from the RBA? One of the big reasons why the RBA is expected to cut rates again is because manufacturing and service sector contracted in the month of September. So um, this is bad news, obviously, because these are two most important um, sectors of the Australian economy. Um, the fact that they're contracting and, uh, means that growth is slowing. So the RBA, if they're looking at this data alone, um, has reason to ease. Um, inflation data only released on a quarterly basis. GDP data also only released on a quarterly basis. Trade confidence numbers also are very important. And tonight we have the RBA minutes. Um, RBA is a central bank um, that likes to keep the markets on their toes. So unlike some other central banks like the ECB, we talked about the ECB quite often, um, who sometimes will prepare the market for a um, decision, or even the Federal Reserve these days, um, although not with this latest QE3, um, the RBA will oftentimes surprise the market because the RBA is a central bank that is very dynamic. They will react to, you know, incoming data. They have a lot of flexibility to tie into ease, so they will um, react quite um, uh, aggressively. And so a lot of their decisions are surprises, and that's why we tend to have a very big reaction in the Aussie dollar when we have a RBA announcement. And the most active trading hours for um, the Australian dollar 
is um, the Asian Open, or Asian trading session around 7 p.m. A lot of Australian economic data tends to be released um, between 7.30 and uh, either at 7.30, 8.30, or 9.30 um, uh, Eastern time, which um, is when, we, which is the Australian, in the morning time in Australia. So the most active market hours tend to be either 7.30, between 7.30 and uh, it's 10 o'clock uh, p.m. Eastern time. Tonight's RBA minutes, for example, are being released at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, but, you know, sometimes when we have um, other data, it could be released at 7.30 or 9.30. And the Aussie will also move right around the New York Open because when we trade currencies, we have two cur we have Currencies, we have two currencies in the pair, so the Aussie dollar will also react to um, U.S. economic data. And um, this morning's retail sales report was a very good example because when we had the stronger um, retail sales number from the U.S., we had um, the Aussie dollar basically fall from 102.45 all the way down to a low of 102.15 purely on the U.S. retail sales number alone. So, the, so if you're trading the Aussie dollar, this is when you can expect the Australian dollar to move. So some trading tips about trading in the Australian dollar. First and foremost, the Australian dollar has a very strong correlation with commodity prices. We'll take a look at some of these correlation charts in a minute. It also has um, a high interest rate, a higher interest rate than any of the other G10 currencies. It's a high beta currency, means, which means that it's very sensitive to um, risk appetite. And it is particularly sensitive to um, the performance of the Chinese economy and Chinese data. So that's why this week will be a very big week for the Australian dollar. And then um, finally, you know, when we get back into a um, carry trade environment, the Australian dollar will um, be affected by carry trade demand. So this shows you a chart. Uh, it's a slightly older chart, but if you pulled up um, a recent chart of the Australian dollar, you'll see that this correlation holds, which is that um, the Australian dollar traditionally has a very, very strong correlation with um, gold. And the reason for that is because um, Australia is one of the world's largest gold producers. So um, on a regular basis, you will see that the Australian dollar will move in lockstep with gold. Recently, in the, in the month of October, we had a quite a bit of a, a slide in the Aussie dollar. If you overlay the Aussie dollar chart with the gold chart, you'll see that um, they kind of have moved in, moving in unison. The only difference is that, for example, today, um, the Aussie dollar is flat. The gold is down 25 bucks. So you may sometimes have a deviation. And you know, I think that this is much more of a U.S. dollar story than anything else. And for those of you that watched CNBC's Money in Motion, we talked about the relationship between the Aussie dollar and gold. If you don't, then I encourage you to, um, to, to Google CNBC Money in Motion and pull up the latest video gallery because you will see the charts between Aussie dollar and gold um, that Todd Gordon showed and um, you know how we talked about how I think that this is more of a story of the U.S. dollar, which is certainly the case today because um, we had a very big move lower in gold as a result of the rally in the U.S. dollar. Um, Aussie and gold also has a strong correlation on a shorter term basis, a five minute chart, but sometimes this correlation will break um, as we've seen today, which is um, Aussie dollar is flat and gold is down quite sharply. Now, Aussie dollar on a short term basis actually has a stronger correlation with copper um, because uh, copper is also you know, a big exporter or something that you know, Australia makes quite a bit. Um, and um, on an intraday basis, what I have found is that the Australian dollar tends to have a much stronger correlation with copper. But once again, today, copper prices, but that, you know, it's not always the case um, because like today, um, uh, copper is down 1% or 1.3% and Aussie dollar is flat. But on a broad perspective, you can see that it's quite important. And um, the last chart that I want to show you for the Aussie dollar is the relationship between the Aussie dollar and the Kiwi dollar, which um, is that you know these currencies t tend to move um, in lockstep as well. Um, so one of the things that people like to trade is kind of deviations or arbitrage. And... Um, since the Aussie dollar and Kiwi dollar tend to move in the same direction, when this, there's divergence, one of the opportunities is to make, maybe, maybe trade the convergence, which is these um, currencies moving back in a similar direction. So this is more important when we talk about the Kiwi dollar. So um, with regards to the outlook for the Australian dollar, I touched on a lot of these already. 
The Aussie dollar is quite weak. It sold off quite aggressively in the month of um, of October so far. The sell-offs actually started in the middle of September when the Aussie dollar was originally um, trading at 106 and it dropped all the way down to um, a low of, I believe it's like 101.50 um, last week. Right now, we're in consolidation mode for the past two weeks. Aussie dollar has been in a tight range. I think that this consolidation um, is a precursor to a breakout this week. We have a lot of things happening that could cause a breakout in the um, Aussie dollar, namely the RBA minutes possibly tonight. But if not, then um, quite possibly the Chinese GDP numbers and economic data on Thursday. Um, in terms of where the RBA stands, the RBA has cut interest rates. They're looking to do more. If there's evidence that they will do more this week, then the break will most likely be to the downside below 101.50. If the RBA is neutral and we actually get some, you know, better Chinese data or we get some Chinese stimulus, then the break could be to the upside. I do not believe that we will see a huge sell-off in the Australian dollar. If the Australian dollar ever gets down to parity, I'm going to start to look at it as a um, good place to enter at value. Because at the end of the day, um, China, the only Aussie dollar will only fall sharply as China's economy slows significantly. And I don't think a hard landing is the case. I think a soft landing is much more likely. And even if there's a hard landing, the People's Bank of China, PBOC, or the Chinese government will most likely sweep in with a fresh round of fiscal monetary stimulus that will kind of lift the Aussie dollar sharply higher. So as a result, I don't think we um, will see a huge, huge sell-off in the Aussie dollar, really book too much below parity. But right now, you know, on a shorter-term basis, we have a lot going on that could lead to either an upside or a downside breakout. So Paul Volcker is asking about Kiwi dollar, which is exactly what we're going to talk about right now. Um, the Kiwi dollar's nickname is, um, or the New Zealand dollar's nickname is the Kiwi. I gave it away already. And um, the reason why it has this nickname is because it's the name of the Australian, sorry, the um, New Zealand state bird or country bird. Um, the New Zealand dollar, even though it's a, is a currency that we follow very closely and a lot of us trade, it is actually not a very actively transacted currency. It actually only accounts for 1.6% of total daily turnover. And um, there's actually fewer transactions or fewer people buying and selling the New Zealand dollar than the people who buy and sell the Swedish krona and the Hong Kong dollar. Yet, um, it is what we consider a major currency, and it is considered a major currency because um, it's an Anglo-Saxon economy. They speak English. Um, it also you know, has a very close correlation with Australia as the second highest interest rate as a relatively stable economy, something that people understand. So, people, so um, a lot of FX traders love to trade it. New Zealand is also an export-dependent economy, and because it is such a tiny country, um, it is even more so sensitive, or even more sensitive than Australia to external shocks, either good or bad. Um, the Central Bank of New Zealand, um, if once someone made a comment about how um, Australia, Australia Central Bank only meets 11 times a year. They wish they had the job. You know, they, being a RBNZ governor may be even better because they only meet eight times a year. Um, in terms of the RBNZ, there is a brand new central bank governor um, coming in. Um, and that is going to be Graham Wheel. He's going to be replacing Alan Bollard. Um, Graham Wheel is, you know, he's new. We don't know too much about him. Um, but, you know, that's why we haven't had any um, significant changes or in monetary policy or even the monetary policy stance of the um, RBNZ because Alan Bollard hasn't, didn't want to rock the boat. Um, he basically wanted to, um, you know, keep things status quo for the RBNZ, um, the new RBNZ governor to come in and, you know, put his own imprint on the um, on New Zealand's monetary policy. So with regards to that, the next um, RBNZ meeting, which I believe is the one where Graham Wheel is going to step in, um, is going to be much more important because um, it will show us uh, give us a sense of the bias of the new RBNZ governor. Now, we do know that um, 
you know, kind of the government is not really all that happy with um, how the economy is doing. The New Zealand finance minister, um, whose uh, his name is English, his last name is English, spoke not too long ago, and he basically said point blank that um, uh, the strong currency is uh, creating headwinds for exporters, and they're kind of disappointed by how the um, New Zealand um, economy is doing. They think that um, the New Zealand economy will continue to recover from the 2008 recession, and you know because they had a um, they had a earthquake um, uh, last year. They're still kind of trying to struggle, or earlier this year too. They're trying to struggle to recover from that. Um, but overall, you know, they are slightly worried about how things are going to transpire. So that's why the Kiwi dollar is trading heavy, but not very, very heavy because we haven't necessarily seen this weakness in economic data. Now, New Zealand is a very, very small economy. It's the fourth smallest of the 30 OECD countries. Now, just to give you a sense of how small it is, its population is about 4.5 million people, which is half of that of the New York City um, uh, population. So it's very, very small. And that was, is what makes the economy so sensitive to um, the ebb and tides of you know, the global economy. Its most important trade partners are Australia and China. 23% um, of its trade goes to Australia and 11% goes to China. So, um, you know, depending upon how the Australian economy do, does, that's usually um, going to tell us how the New Zealand economy fares. China, we've got um, Chinese data this week that will also impact how the New Zealand dollar trades. You know, New Zealand is an agricultural industry, but um, they also you know, have a lot of services. Typically, though, the economy relies primarily on dairy exports. So the price of milk, the earnings of Frontera um, are very, very important, something that New Zealand dollar traders watch very closely. Also, the price of meat is very important. So one of the things that New Zealand has benefited from is the increase in meat prices, because meat prices have gone up um, as a result of the U.S. drought. New Zealand doesn't have a drought, so they're just kind of um, rolling it in. They're, um, you know, taking in the new higher prices, putting it into, um, and you know, putting into the higher profitability basket, um, and shoring it up for a rainy day because they don't necessarily have the same drought scenarios as the U.S. and yet they're benefiting from the higher prices, and that's actually providing underlying support for the New Zealand economy. Now we don't get too much economic data from New Zealand. Um, we uh, really only get economic data um, on a quarterly basis that includes GDP, employment numbers, um, consumer prices, PMI, manufacturing and service sector, or business PMI and services to PMI is released monthly, but really not all that market moving. On a day-to-day -day basis, the New Zealand dollar really trades on the market's risk appetite, how they feel about any shocks to Australia. This week, it will be all about Chinese data and also the bias of the RBA. Um, the RBNZ meeting is also important, but you know, not a huge thing for the New Zealand dollar. The most active trading hours for um, New Zealand are similar to the most active trading hours for Australia, which um, is usually about um, 7, 7.30 um, in, uh, Asian time. But actually, we get to New Zealand data a little earlier. So we usually get um, New Zealand economic data between 5 o'clock um, or even 5.30 to about 6 o'clock um, New Zealand, sorry, U.S. time. So tonight, for example, we have New Zealand consumer prices, and that's being released at 5.45 p.m. Eastern time. And then, um, and then uh, when we sometimes get data overnight, it's closer to around 8 p.m. New York time. So, you know, there's, that's the time of focus that you want to have in the New Zealand dollar, which is that the New Zealand dollar can have a little bit more reaction earlier in the Asian trading session than some of the other um, Asian currencies, and even the Australian dollar, because Australia reduces, uh, releases their data a little bit later. The New Zealand dollar also reacts to U.S. data, obviously, when it's released, which is usually either 8.30 a.m. New York time or 10 um, a.m. New York time. Trading tips for the New Zealand dollar um, has a very strong correlation with the Australian dollar, and it also has a strong correlation for commodity prices. Um, it has, uh, has a high interest rate, or at least you know, the second highest interest rate of the major currencies, and it's also considered a high beta currency um, because um, it is, the country's economy is very volatile. 
Um, it's a very small economy and it's very, very sensitive. I mean, high beta, another word for it to, to replace beta is sensitivity. So high beta means high sensitivity. And um, it also, you know, kind of benefits or suffers from carry trade demand. So I don't have a um, Kiwi dollar copper chart here, but as Paul Volcker pointed out, the New Zealand dollar does have a decent correlation with copper because it has decent correlation with the Aussie dollar. Why do they not release uh, economic data on a monthly basis? The reason why they don't release economic data on a monthly basis is because the monthly data tends to be very volatile because New Zealand's economy is so small. So that's why they tend to like to release data more on a quarterly basis because it um, is usually a bit more smooth out. Um, this shows you the most important correlation for the New Zealand dollar, which is its relationship for, with the Aussie dollar. And it's a correlation that not only exists on a daily level, but also exists um, on a uh, intraday level. So, and this is a five minute chart showing you that the correlation is also very close on an intraday level. Now, it won't be 100% of the time, but it will be enough for, um, for traders to get a sense of how it trades. Because even this chart here, you can see that sometimes there will be outsized moves uh, that differ. Today is not one of those days because the Aussie and the Kiwi dollar are both up. Um, the magnitude sometimes is different, but there will be times when the Aussie dollar is up and the Kiwi dollar is down, um, or it just doesn't move down enough because right now um, the Kiwi dollar is on a percentage basis um, less off its highs than the Aussie dollar. So the outlook for the New Zealand dollar, the New Zealand dollar has been consolidating for the past week and a half. It's also primed for a breakout. It looks like, you know, I'm actually more optimistic the Kiwi dollar than I am um, the Aussie dollar um, because it's looking a little bit more uh, firmer and um, I think that there's a probably a chance for an upside breakout but of course it all hinges upon risk appetite. I think the better opportunity for those of you who want to consider it is maybe um, Aussie Kiwi because Aussie Kiwi has been under quite a bit of pressure right now. It's trading at the day's low. I think we could get um, you know steeper losses, maybe even a move down um, below 25 to maybe even 23.85. Um, Aussie Kiwi carry trade demand so weak, um, yen will spur more carry trade positions is a question that I'm getting. Um, it will, but we're not really in a carry trade environment right now um, because of um, the uncertainty in the market and the, the reality of the um, Australians cutting interest rates. So I think that um, that's something that's important to pay attention to because um, if the Australians continue to cut interest rates, carry trade will not be something that um, is offered in a sh that is that attractive for Australia and New Zealand. Um, so last, um, we'll talk about the Canadian dollar. The, um, the Canadian dollar's nickname is the loony, um, which is also the state bird. The Canadian dollar is the seventh most actively traded currency, so it's actually less actively traded than the Australian dollar, but it's still something that um, people follow very closely. Now, Canada is a very unique animal because um, it is more sensitive oftentimes to how the um, Canadian, to how, it's more sensitive to how the U.S. economy is doing than how um, the Canadian economy is doing. That is why oftentimes, you know, you may see good U.S. data be positive for the Canadian dollar, not negative. And one good example to that today uh, was today's um, reaction to the retail sales report because U.S. retail sales came in stronger. Dollar cat actually fell instead of rallied because people believe you know, what is good for the U.S. is good for Canada because U.S. consumes 80% of Canadian exports. Um, Canada is also the world's ninth largest oil exporter. You know, something also important to um, pay attention to because this really impacts um, how the Canadian dollar trades because um, some of you were talking about how um, the Canadian dollar, at the very start of the session, the Canadian dollar was falling very sharply against the U.S. dollar. And the reason why it was falling sharply was because oil prices um, was falling sharply. Oil prices, you know, fell like $2 um, this morning. And that $2 decline drove um, dollar cad sharply higher. Now, dollar cad has reversed a part of its rally. And the reason why it's reversing a part of this rally right now is because oil prices are also rebounding. So, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, oil prices is very, very important 
to the Canadian dollar. And you know, you see that um, very clearly in today's price action. So um, in terms of the um, Canadian dollar, the Bank of Canada's um, mandate is price stability and to keep inflation near 2%. Now, um, we have Canadian CPI numbers at the end of this week. Um, right now, annualized CPI growth is running at 1.2%. So we are below um, inflation, um, the inflation target. So if the BOC wants to ease, they have plenty of room to do so. If they want to tighten, um, they could do so as well, but they risk driving inflation lower. Um, the Bank of Canada is the only central bank talking about raising interest rates right now, which is quite shocking. They actually started talking about raising interest rates back in April. And the fact that they were talking about raising interest rates back in April um, is one of the big reasons why the dollar CAD has been in such a strong downtrend. The dollar CAD has fallen from a high above 104 um, in June all the way to a low of 96.50 in September, and this was all consistent with the hawkish monetary policy stance of the BOC. Now, between April and you know this month, every single time the BOC um, said they were willing, looking to possibly raise interest rates, people were really skeptical because they did not think that the BOC would have to follow through with um, raising interest rates because data hasn't been so good up until now. Now, lately, we've seen some pretty good evidence of Canadian data, starting with you know, today's existing home sales. I mean, existing home sales rose 2.5% in the month of September. The market was looking for a decline of 5%. Um, also, the labor market numbers was very, very strong. We had a really nice job growth um, in Canada, um, uh, according to the most recent report. Manufacturing activity declined a little bit, but still very much in expansionary territory. So um, the economy is doing so well, and people are thinking maybe the BOC could actually follow through with their t um, calls for raising interest rates. So that is why you know, the Canadian dollar has performed so well. Um, the U.S. Is, is the most important trade partner of Canada, accounting for a majority of the trade activity. You know, everyone else is very, very far behind. So what matters most for, for Canada is really going to be how the um, U.S. economy performs. They're um, also an export-dependent economy, but they also do a lot of services. The economy relies on industrial goods and metals and energy products. So as a result, it shouldn't surprise you that um, the Canadian dollar has a really strong correlation with commodity prices, oil prices in particular, because um, they own the second largest amount of oil sands or oil reserves. Um, and so that is why today you saw the Canadian dollar moved so much um, based upon how um, oil prices were moving. Um, Canadian economic data is released you know, every single month, um, and so these are the most important pieces of Canadian data, including um, the employment numbers, retail sales, um, IVPMI. They don't release the service sector activity index. Um, they only release the IVPMI manufacturing, service, manufacturing activity index. Nonetheless, it's still very important. It's something that we follow very closely. Consumer prices um, also, you know, scheduled um, for release, something that we watch closely as well. That's going to be followed by GDP numbers, trade numbers, um, and the Bank of Canada monetary policy announcement is always important. Um, the most active trading hours for Canada is um, is uh, 7 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. New York time. Um, and the reason for that is because a lot of um, uh, Canadian data is either released at 7 a.m. or 8.30 a.m. So um, that's when the Canadian dollar can be the most volatile. Most of the data, however, is released at 8.30. Like this week's CPI numbers will be released at 8.30. Um, and so the Canadian dollar, 8.30 is a really interesting time for Canada, especially when we have Canadian and U.S. employment reports being released at the same time, which will happen. When we have both economic releases being released at the same time, um, the Canadian dollar will oftentimes have a delayed reaction to, um, the, uh, to the Canadian data, because it will first react to the U.S. data and then react to the Canadian data. And more often than not, it is the Canadian data that will impact the um, the Canadian dollar, sorry, the U.S. data that will impact the Canadian dollar more. Even on days, and this is a trading tip, even on days when we don't have U.S. data, the Canadian dollar will oftentimes have a delayed reaction. It doesn't always react immediately. So it does give people a little bit of an opportunity to come in. So the initial reaction may be a little erratic. Five minutes, ten minutes after, then you get more of the pure reaction 
in the Canadian dollar. So dollar CAD doesn't always rise, um, doesn't always rise when we have um, good U.S. data. It actually oftentimes will fall when we have good U.S. data because people think what is good for the U.S. is even better for Canada because Canada is a smaller country, smaller economy, and so they are a higher beta currency or a more sensitive currency. Um, it tends to have a um, delayed reaction to Canadian data. It has a very strong reaction, um, oftentimes to U.S. data. Oil prices is very important, and it is also considered a risk currency. So this um, is a chart of dollar CAD and oil. It is an inverse chart showing you um, that how dollar CAD and oil will react in the opposite direction. And today was a perfect example of that, where you pulled up an intraday chart of um, the dollar CAD and oil, you'll see that they were basically moving in the opposite direction on an intraday basis. So one chart will rise and one chart will fall because, you know, it's dollar CAD versus oil. So if oil prices rise, it's good for the Canadian dollar, but negative for dollar CAD. So in terms of the outlook for the Canadian dollar, um, the BOC is hawkish. Canadian data has been doing pretty well. And I think that um, the case for a rate hike builds in Canada. And I believe that this should lead to outperformance of the Canadian dollar. Maybe not so much against the U.S. data, U.S. dollar, because that's really kind of caught in the range. But, you know, definitely some good opportunities to look for um, in terms of the upside in the Canadian dollar against the Australian dollar and the Canadian dollar against um, the Japanese yen and maybe even the Canadian dollar against the euro. So the crosses in Canada provide some nice opportunities. So with that, I um, uh, want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about um, the new services that we have in BK Forex. I promise you I won't spend too much of your time. We just relaunched our website, and we launched something called the BK Trading Club. We still um, are um, offering BK signals, and in fact, um, we have um, enhanced the signals that we offer. I encourage you to visit our new website, which is bkforex.com. Read all about it. We are now, um, uh, now publishing or giving out um, uh, extended amount of um, trading signals, so we've increased the quality and the quantity of our trading signals on a week-to-week -week basis or even a day-to-day -day basis. Our subscribers get position trades, day trades, news trades um, throughout the course of the week. There are one to two day trades, um, uh, intraday trades um, in the euro dollar that we publish. We also give out positional trades, which is good for those of you that are more medium-term to longer-term traders, taking advantage of some of the fundamental themes that we talk about. And then we also have news trades, which are about 8 to 12 ideas per week. With positional trades, we have um, short-term trades where we establish a view on economic data. And we also check to see if the view is consistent with risk appetite and sentiment. And um, we identify key levels for entry. And so this is kind of our thought process for the swing trades. And we also have medium-term positional trades, which take advantage of key stories and themes. So, you know, views on whether the fiscal cliff will kill the U.S. dollar, whether the European sovereign debt crisis will go away, whether pork shortage will have critical will cripple certain economies. These are the things that we trade in with our positional trades. With our intraday trades, we trade um, the euro, and we trade it on a short-term basis. All of our trading signals are sent to via SMS, but um, we now um, are publishing trade ideas almost on a um, daily basis for our BK flow trades. We have trades that enter at market. We have trades that enter when certain levels are triggered. Um, these are different types of trades, so we have a lot of um, trade ideas for those of you that are looking for trade ideas. That's what we provide to our subscribers. Um, all of this is tracked also on a private Twitter feed um, for our subscribers, aside from being sent um, via SMS, email, and on our website. On a weekly basis, our subscribers get our um, Excel spreadsheet with our um, news trading battle plan where we outline what we expect for each piece of economic data and why and what the potential trades are. Every single day, we get our subscribers get a detailed analysis of a news trade with charts and with an explanation. Every trading signal is based on fundamental technical sentiment, tells you what we trade, why we trade with stops and limits and updates along the way. Now, the BK Trading Club is an educational service, um, and these are the different things that we offer. Basically, every single day, um, we have a live webinar that's happening between 9 to 10 a.m. There's a different theme for each um, webinar. It's archived in our BK Trading Club. Monday is about Monday morning game plan. Tuesday is about technical analysis. Wednesday is about world markets. Thursday is about trading strategies. Four, Fridays is about um, 
going through your charts, where we show you our charts, you show us yours, and we walk us everyone through the charts. Every single day you get a um, tr chart of the day pointing out an interesting opportunity that you may not be looking at. So one of the ones, uh, so today, uh, the what trade that we were looking at or the opportunity was Aussie CAD, and we explained why from a fundamental and technical basis this currency pair is on our radar. And then we have five hot ideas every day that we give our um, BK Club clients to share that information with them. And uh, it comes with a chart, explanations of fundamentals, technicals, and sentiment. And then finally, we have a private archive of trading strategies, videos of trading strategies um, that basically provide you information on what you can get. So I encourage you all to um, follow up, uh, to take a look at our brand new website, which is bkforex.com. Let me just flip back to you to show you what it looks like. Um, and read through it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. There's a lot of information, a lot of detail there on what we offer in our new services. So now um, I just want to open the, door up, the floor up to a couple questions um, before we end our session. Why didn't they call it CAD dollar instead of dollar CAD? It's because usually the strongest currency um, is the first one being um, listed or the Queen's currency. It's just convention. The Canadians will look at it as CAD dollar. Um, and the rest of the world looks at it as dollar CAD. It's the same you know, how some currencies are looked at as Euro dollar or Aussie dollar and not um, dollar Aussie. It's just convention. We call CAD Looney because it's a nickname, um, and it's a nickname uh, it comes from the, the country state's bird. So that is why we call you know the Looney is Canada state country's um, you know bird, and so we call it um, that as the nickname. Futures, why futures sometimes called yen dollar? Yeah, sometimes the futures currency we call it yen dollar, but you know in the spot market we call it dollar yen. How much time will the club be free? Well, the, all the information is on the website. The BK Trading Club is part of the BK Trading Signal Service. We also have a way to get it for free. Um, but I would click on the link and um, go and read the details there. What is my view on gold? I am actually um, bullish gold, and I think that any dip on gold should be at, looked at as an opportunity to buy at lower levels. And we actually talked about this on CNBC's um, um, Money in Motion show last Friday because we talked about how all of the easing by central banks um, will end up being very inflationary and it devalues the value of those currencies. So, uh, uh, you know, the biggest winner should be gold. So um, I am bullish gold. I think it's a good opportunity to get long at lower levels, um, and in terms of where it's trading right now, um, it's at about 1730, and I believe there's some support in gold at around 1700, so just kind of watch out for that. So when GDP for China fall below 7.4%, we said market to be risk averse of what? Exactly. If GDP in China grows by less than 7.4%, you can expect a risk aversion move, which you know basically translates to sell-off in many of the currencies. Are we generally skeptical with Chinese data? Yes, we are generally skeptical about Chinese data um, in many different ways. One, in terms of its strength, and secondly, in terms of its um, accuracy in terms of in regards to its depiction of the Chinese economy. But even though we may think about how China is cooking the books, this is all we have, um, which is the official data. And that's what everyone um, from the smartest traders on Wall Street um, to hedge fund managers to us individual traders have to work off of, which is the Chinese official data. So even if we may say, okay, um, let's say the Chinese data comes out 7.5% and say there's no way that the Chinese economy is doing that well, um, it will still lead to a risk on move because that's all we get. We don't get anything else. And so, um, you know, that's basically what we have to focus on. In terms of the Chinese data, the Chinese data on Thursday, which is when the GDP number um, is going to be released, um, is coming out at 2200 military time, which is 10 p.m. Eastern time. And um, if you are interested, you know, there's lots of calendars out there that show you what time it's being released.
do you think dollar, the dollar will stay above, will return and stay above 80 soon? I think it's a possibility. Um, you know, the data has been pretty good for the U.S. The dollar yen could rally above 80. Um, either way, you know, it really depends upon whether risk appetite can be sustained and whether it can be sustained will be determined by Chinese data um, this week, I think. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you all for um, joining me today and um, encourage you uh, to take a look at our new website. We're very excited about it. We're very proud of our new offerings. Um, so definitely give it a look and um, email us if you have any questions. Thank you so much.